Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Well Nerds Podcast. My name is Slater, and I'm here with Eric and Caitlin. Hey, guys. Hello. And uh, we are talking science today. And nonsense. And we're just making stuff up, probably. <laughs> At least I am. <laughs> this now, is episode four, by the way. What? I didn't say that in the, the intro? No. No. It's okay. That was our third intro, and I still left something out. We got you. It's okay. <laughs> no. Um, so I was... We were actually just writing down ideas of later topics, and then one of them got me talking about this animal called Pachycetus. Yes. Which is? A previous version in evolutionary history of whales. So we're talking dinosaurs. And I know neither <laughs> neither of them are paleontologists. No. But they have read a lot on this stuff. But I like Jurassic Park. It's like one of my favorite movies. Life finds a way. <laughs> Jeez, you guys are giving me an ass attack. Um, well, what, so where did this whole Pachycetus fascination come from? Well, I read a book. Actually, I didn't read you it. Listened I, I listened to, it. to the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, in the book, it talks about the past, present, and future of whales. And in the past, talking about where they came from mm-hmm. and how... They came from land to the sea yep, and went back and forth, right? Yeah, so d- let's go even further back than that. So the- oh, whoa, hit me, with some, <laughs> hit me with some years. Is this 500? <laughs> is this 5 million or is this 45? I think it's like 45 million years. Is when they started going back to the water. So yeah. before that, like the fish came out onto the land, all these different land animals came to be, and then about 45 million years ago, the land mammals started going back to the water. And that's where we're talking. Pachycetus hit the scene like 45 million years ago. And it was this animal that went in and out of the water, and it was a freshwater animal. Um, and its nose was like, it's what are now blowholes. It was nose was at the very tip of its face, and it still had four limbs and a really strong tail. And I was reading something that the mm. only thing that even gives people a clue that it's, uh, a whale relative was something about the ear bones or something like that? Yes. Bony wall around the middle ear is like the thickness of it is what ma- people I thought it was because they uh, had the even toes. Well, that was discovered later. Pachycetus was identified as an animal that could go in and out of the water and was one of the missing links as we get to whales. Um, but then they looked at like the wrist bones and realized that that's the same wrist bones as animals called even-toed ungulates. So like elk, cows, hippos, hippos. Yeah, I think hippos are what one of the animals that's descended or they're the same say, common same ancestor common on land. ancestors. Yeah, and that's the closest one that's living today, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the closest land version. Well, it's it, it uses the water a lot too. So and that's probably why they're so big. Yeah, well, and well, as, kind you, of. as you get... Because um, they are in the water more, you know. Yeah, and then as they went back into the water, they specialized, right? Because then you get dolphins, which are small and fast, and they hunt fast-moving prey. And then you get whales that are just enormous, but they're also very slow, and they eat huge volumes of small things. So they started to get really specialized as they, as they use the ocean in a different way. And um, <clears throat> we were looking at some images of skulls about 36 million years ago the nose started to move up towards the top of the head, so more what we know today. Um, And so they, it's kind of interesting to look at how they started to evolve to not have to pick their head up to breathe, and then they started to lose their hind limbs, and then their tails started to become their main source of locomotion. So then also, the one of the evidences, I would say, of of them becoming mostly using their tail but then at one time they had four limbs is these things called vestigial structures in their body so they do even whales today you can like if you see skeletons that are complete in museums they have these little weird things coming off the back of the whale skeleton and their their hind limbs their ankle bones that are still like in the body wall of the animal they don't they're not connected to anything anymore that's why they're called vestigial but they still do have hind limbs yeah and then uh, over time i know uh people used to think they were vestigial and uh, completely useless but i think oh what maybe about five years ago or more or less uh, mm-hmm. someone actually figured out especially our male whales actually are uh, kind of uh, using those uh, vestigial uh, bones for uh, sexual activities. I'll just leave it at that. 
Science. Science. <laughs> I think it's just amazing how we can learn so much from the bones. You know. Yeah, I think uh, no matter what type of uh, animal you're in, obviously, looking back at the past is really going to give you a clue. You know what's going on with these animals, and it's it's funny because you know you don't think of it this way, but we're seeing like animals that are kind of like moving into water uh, currently. In fact, if you look at like our, our sea otters, you know, you, you look at the front, they got paws. You look mm-hmm. at the back, you know, they, they got little little flippers. So mm-hmm. it's like, hmm, you know, this is kind of like something that's in between, you know, heading into water. I mean, you never know. Millions of years from now, those otters might have something different up front. Imagine if they're like 10 feet bigger, otters. Well, that's true. And what it, uh, the book that Slater is listening to that he's referring to, what's it called? Spying on Spying Whales? Spying on Whales. I think they said there was like over 600 variations of a whale that are extinct. Oh, yeah. Already. So think of how many things are changing and we're just a blip on the radar. They're still finding a um, lot of new species of dolphins and whales all over the world. I know South America mm-hmm. is a big spot for finding uh, large uh, whales from the past. And also, Slater, you might remember this. Back in Orange County, uh, still to this day, when they're expanding those toll roads and building those new neighborhoods in South Orange County, uh, they're still finding uh, uh, dolphin skulls. And they're like one of the kind. They're, they're just, you know, ones that they just have found in that area and still trying to Makes figure them dig. out. <laughs> I know. It makes me want to go dig, too. Let's do a whale nerd's <laughs> fossil dig. Actually, you know, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I used to kind of dabble into this stuff. I wish I got more into it. But um, there is a place that's kind of world famous over in Bakersfield. It's known as Shark Tooth Hill. And uh, there's a museum in that area called the Buena Vista uh, Museum. And uh, they actually offer digs uh, to the general public on certain days in that Shark Tooth Hill area. And mm-hmm. they're still finding, uh, you know, marine life from the you past the over there. <laughs> it's probably not too safe. I mean, it's all dirt roads there, but uh, I've gone there myself. I got it. it, it is stir crazy. yeah. It is private <laughs> land, so uh, you, you're able to keep uh, certain items. So I do have a bunch of whale verts uh, from that area, whales from the past. But walking around that area is pretty neat. There was a 40 foot complete skeleton of a whale that was what? just unexcavated, just kind of sitting there that they were protecting with these. Uh, this, this barrier because I guess there's cows over there. It's kind of a ranch area, so they don't want them stepping over it. But oh, um, cool. whales, well, ribs, well, mandibles were all over the place. Uh, sh- there's an extinct type of mako shark. Their teeth are just scattered all over this area and to the point where you don't even need to dig. You can, like, look on the ground and pick them, uh, pick them up in certain places. But, yeah, Google uh, Shark Tooth Hill uh, in the Bakersfield area and, or, or uh, the uh, Buena Vista Museum. And uh, that place is a good resource for, uh, you know, good uh, whales from the past. And uh, they have a really simple museum. It's kind of like two stories. I haven't been to it in a long time, but uh, neat stuff in there. Do they think that maybe all these things accumulated in one spot because of a current that brought all these bones in there? Or, or did these things – because not that many things died in just one spot. Yeah. Well, Be, well besides – okay, so – that was going to lead me to this. There's that place what, in Chile right. that has, uh, what's it called? Well, they just, are you talking about, oh, the Sarabayana place? Yeah, Sarabayana. Yeah, yeah. so they, and it, interestingly enough, they had a, a very recent UME, which is an unusual mortality event of large whales. There's like 153 or 135. Pilot whales? Um, no, it was like say whales mostly. There was some fin whales like what two or three years ago and they were like all just fresh like over the course of six months there's just like hundreds of dead whales on the beach there and so maybe something like that's happened in some of those places but also the currents or the way the the tectonic plates moved ended up pushing all those skeletons together oh, okay that's why because so but why do you know anything about that um sarah Baena, why all the whales are landing in that one spot i don't no we could make that another topic when we Learn it. more. <laughs> yeah, I just remember them mentioning Sarah Baena a bunch and how the whales land there, and still whales are landing there. Mm-hmm. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and as that's a whole other topic. We talked about dolphin speciation too. When the Southern Ocean opened up and started circulating all around the Antarctic, when the land bridge was gone, things changed really fast for whales and dolphins in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, that trips me out too. How the, the, you know South America and then Antarctica touched. Yeah, the Western Antarctic Peninsula and South America were touching. Yeah. 
It's and now, nice. and now all of a sudden, whales are passing and it through there. Well, and it completely changed the way the ocean works in the southern hemisphere. It rerouted all the currents because the water had new ways to flow. What is that? The peninsula that goes down? Because you, you fly out of there when you go across Antarctica. Um, on the South America side, you mean? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of people fly down into like Ushuaia and Argentina. Ushuaia, yeah. yeah. Okay, and Argentina. then they, the, you can actually fly down onto Antarctica too. I, I guess the Cheeseman's trip is doing that. They're gonna fly in instead of crossing the Drake Passage. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, when I was talking to him about going, it was, <clears throat> I'm not, but um, we're t- uh, you fly down to that Chile or uh, uh, Ushuaia, mm-hmm. and then you fly from there to. Yeah, but a lot of places also they just cross the Drake Passage by boat, and that's pretty gnarly. I think they cross it on the way back by boat. Oh, they might be coming back by boat. Yeah, you're right. I think so. So nutty. One day we'll all go to Antarctica, and then we'll be able to talk about that. Yeah, yes. I think a whole bunch of our circle of whale friends are actually leaving next week, isn't it? For yeah, they're Antarctica. leaving next week. Maybe one of them wants to come on here and talk about it. Yeah. Oh. We invite someone to come. Yeah, out good idea. Us. Yeah, that's a good idea. We can. Hit them up Just so you know, back. if you're going on the Cheeseman's Antarctica trip, now you're on our radar. <laughs> and you can can you bring back a penguin, please? Um, just photos for me, thanks. I heard they're kind of smelly. Speaking of <laughs> whale guidelines, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, didn't you have a? Are you still? Did you have a question? Did you have a question about carbon dating? Oh, oh yeah. Speaking of the bones, Pachycetus. How do they tell how old they are? That's what I don't get. It's like they're like 45 million years. I'm like, how do you know it's 45 million years? Like I can understand like a million, but like 45 million, it just seems crazy. Yeah, some of it's actually just based on uh, the the soil, you know, or the layer of soil these animals were found. So, you know, for example, when you go on a, a cliffside, uh, you'll see that there's visual, visual uh, I can't talk right now, but visually, <laughs> you can see that there's a difference in the different layers of you know of sediment every few feet so think like the grand canyon yeah a good a good geologist i mean i, I kind of dabbled in it but you know a good geologist can can tell you the age of those layers and stuff like that and there's actually uh charts for certain areas that will tell you uh you know the age of the layers you're looking at but in fact, how did they age the layers yeah i, I don't know exactly now, carbon dating science I know, some, layers. I know some stuff they can do <laughs> yeah you can use carbon layer uh carbon dating and then uh, but yeah, what's funny is we should, I think we might be able to find someone who's really good with paleontology because we're actually kind of in a, a hot spot here. Uh, I know right off of uh, the Aptos area, that's kind of like a, a hot spot for mm-hmm. whale fossils. Also, a little bit further inland, I know, I think that's Scotts Valley area up yes. to 17 is also uh, known for a, a hot spot. If for, you know a uh, paleontologist, let us know. Yeah, let us know, guys. <laughs> Especially if they specialize with, uh, you know, Marine mammals. But basically how carbon dating works is they calculate the I'll just watch a couple breakdown. of YouTube videos. Yeah, watch it on YouTube. They calculate the <laughs> breakdown of the chemicals in the skeleton, and then that, that follows like a mathematical pattern. And so you can then take a sample of the of the bones or whatever's around the bones that has carbon. Yeah. Think of something to do with the breakdown of something too, right? Yeah. Is it the breakdown of carbon? It's I- yeah. Isotope breakdown. Yeah. So they, they're measuring that, that time. That so you can breakdown. do some chemistry and some math, and you can figure it out. Yeah, my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, people. We we don't know everything, but I hope this inspires you to, to look it up yourself. Maybe even well, it inspires us to look. Yeah, it up. I'm a, yeah, might be, have to do some uh, looking up on the exact way to. Use and what an age we live in that you can just look it up on YouTube now, and somebody will explain. Yeah, there's probably a that's YouTube video. Oh, I guarantee video. there's one. There's probably a YouTube video to teach you how to carbon date things. When we were in college, that wasn't a thing. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube has been around since you were in college. Yeah, but not the availability of information like that. Well, 2019 is a fun time to be a college student. Yeah, but if you guys are interested in, uh, yeah, uh, old uh, ancient whales or just uh, paleontology, um, if you're from California, I know, man, the uh, Los Angeles Natural History Museum has a great, uh, great exhibit uh, featuring pretty much uh, those some of those ancient whales I was talking about. I know they have a a display with Pachycetus that we just were talking about, and also all the cool stuff that everyone expects to see, you know, T-Rex and uh, and all that good stuff. In fact, um, when I did dabble in paleontology, I got to meet the guy, uh, a guy named Harley Garbani, who actually found a lot of those T-Rexes inside that museum. So that is, uh, we're lucky to have that in California Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. I've never been there. I have a question. Yeah. What? Has anyone found... Whale fossils in the Grand Canyon. Mm. Good question. I know there's seashells. 
I don't know if there's whales. Everywhere. I don't know if they've ever found whales in the Grand Canyon. I know there's, but there's definitely marine animals, marine fossils, fish, and and invertebrates. We'll Google it. We'll Google. it. Google it, or you guys can Google it for yourselves. Yeah, but, yeah, that's a good. Google it and let us know, and then we'll put. It I mean, on you know, I know in the middle of the Midwest. I mean, they find you know marine fossils, and they find like some big stuff too, like Mosasaurus, uh, you know, Ichthyosaurus, which are. I think uh, they find stuff in Vegas, which. Yeah, yeah. Plesiosaurs. I know they found in like California in the Midwest. That's uh, the animal that kind of looks like uh, what. Uh, a lot of people think it's the Loch Ness monster. So, well, all the way up to like m- most of Nevada was has been accreted onto the continent. So, like these little land masses that were out in the open ocean have slowly been smashed up against the North American plate, and so that's how you get those marine things all the way out in, in Nevada in the desert. Sometimes I just want to go back to Pangaea. Can we just time travel? Yeah, I got a flux capacitor in my backpack. <laughs> Where's the DeLorean? I don't know. Oh, dang it. I was just going to say, I want to watch that movie. <laughs> yeah, I'll hit 88.8 miles per hour. We'll be there. Yeah, and then we'll podcast about it. We'll let you know. Well, I don't think I've actually found any. I've only found one bone myself, and it was like the jaw of a coyote, and it was in Big Sur. Oh, that's cool. I've never found a jaw. I remember, I, I think I called Eric, and I was like, am I allowed to touch this thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You don't know what's growing on. I find bones somewhere. on the beach, but I, I honestly couldn't tell you what they're from. Sometimes I know they're from a bird because they're really porous, but that doesn't mean someone wasn't eating a chicken leg on the beach and then threw it in yeah, the water. Yeah, exactly. Every time it's crazy windy here, there's like a hundred birds on Pacific uh, on Lovers Point. Yeah, there's a lot of dead birds on the beach. Remember, we, me and you were looking for those owls the other day. Or yeah, a ago, and there was there were, birds. every every pretty much there was like one dead bird that represented like every species that frequents the. The Monterey yeah. Bay it was pretty pretty intense, and there was a sea lion carcass there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is it's kind of not unusual. There's a lot of things that get unloaded into the environment near shore when it rains, and so that can be a problem. Yeah, especially right there in that spot where we were. There's like the runoff from like next to Embassy Suites. You know, there's always that like yeah, dirty little the, pond the, that's in the what is that sand. Laguna Grande area? Yeah, yeah. I don't but if you guys ever there. come upon a marine mammal uh, bones. Uh, you know, or a carcass. Yeah, I try to steer clear of it. Just uh, you know, you never know. There's it's pretty stinky, and trust me, that that smell. Well, it doesn't come out. Yeah, it doesn't come out if you, if you touch it, which you really shouldn't. Yeah, it doesn't come out. Don't let your dog roll in it. You will regret it. <laughs> yeah, a few of us have. Uh, you have to take a tomato bath. Not a few. <laughs> I don't even think that would work. <laughs> no, I think it's oatmeal, right? Yeah, every time there's a stranding yeah, out tomato. here. Tomato. Yeah. For every time there's a stranding out here, a few of us always go take a look at it, and mm-hmm. uh, yeah, if you get too close, man, that smell stays on you forever. Yeah, and you're not supposed to harvest any parts from the animals now because they're federally protected. Fossils is a little bit different, but. Like, a, like if a gray whale calf carcass is on the what, beach or something, you can't take from it. I know. I mean, Eric Eric and I went to that humpback up mm-hmm. near Aptos. Apto, what is it? Aptos. Aptos. Yeah. And Aptos. <laughs> Aptos. Aptos. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, <laughs> he tried to lift the pectoral fin. Was it really heavy? It was he really heavy. heavy. He didn't even try. Yeah. He just touched I, it. I like, touched it. It was, it was, yeah, really heavy. That peck fin from that calf was still, Well, their bones know, are really dense. Yeah, it was still close to six feet long. I, I wanted to lay down next to it. To, to measure use it. A, to be a yeah, size reference. And, yeah, it was bigger than me. This was just a, a calf that washed up. What was the length? Maybe I'll make later? that our thumbnail. I have, a, I, have a, I have a picture of you near that whale. Yeah, I think the, <laughs> I think the, I think the 20 length. Some, 20, like. It was close to 30 feet. Yeah, yeah. 28. I remember I we, they, they told us 30 feet. Before we got there, we got there like that's thirty feet. Yeah. yeah. Well, the peck fin alone was like way like at least fourteen feet. So was it? No, juvenile would you say fourteen? Was it a calf? Juvenile? I think it was. Yeah. It was for sure really. taller than me, and I'm five seven and three quarters. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely a, a younger <laughs> whale. But that was the year. I mean, we had that, and before that, we had that gray whale. I think most of us that gray whale calf that most of us saw. Um, oh, with the crazy was, rake marks? Yeah, that was from a predation, was I think, so cool. that we yeah. actually witnessed ourselves. Almost every season, you can see a gray whale carcass from a calf on the shore. Okay, I think that that carcass, that I didn't even get to go look at it, but it, I think it was that one that I was filming from the drone that yeah. they, that they really? let disappear. Because the, the killer whales were attacking it, right? And then mm-hmm. um, they just beelined away. And, and everybody oh, thought that there was another up. kill in the, in the yeah, bay, yeah, and they yeah, went yeah. over to that one. And then the so next the day, estate. or like a day, the next day, it like washed up on shore there. Was it pretty whole the next day? Uh, it was, the, the lower jaw was missing. 
uh, throughout the body. I, I still have pictures up. But, well, um, they could have circled back. For yeah, the lower jaw was sure. missing. There's a few chunks missing like towards the, the you know behind the blowhole area but yeah, it was pretty intact but a lot of rake marks in fact i think this was the one that we saw some uh blue shark and some white shark uh, bite mm. marks on too yeah that's also kind of cool when you see a carcass up on the on the beach you can see what's been gnawing yeah. on and then that was the only crazy one that went all the way up to go see that blue whale that um unfortunately got um hit by that ship all the way yeah. up in Point Reyes. And that was quite an experience, 60 foot long, um, deceased uh, blue whale Was it like beach. crazy, um, like the gas, like was it filled up and all like gross and like think, already? Or was it, it was already pretty, it was, it was already uh, pretty cut up. As someone, yeah, up. already checked yeah. it out. And Once they, were, they cut them open, they, they oh, started they already, to Oh, they already cut it? Out. Yeah, I have, pic- I, you guys might recall the pictures. Yeah, they were like perfect rectangles of, you know, of this whale all over the beach and all the pleats were there. It was pretty intense. But I know this might sound kind of depressing, guys, but uh, this is unfortunately the only way that some people, even us, you know, get to see these whales up close, you know. A lot of people never, ever get this opportunity. So it's kind of a thing that uh, if you get a chance, definitely do it. You really get an idea. You know, 50 feet, when you hear it, it sounds big, but when you're standing next to feet, 50 feet, it really is, you know, a lot bigger than, yeah. than Thing, it sounds. Like the little barnacles that you think are little barnacles. No, they're are like, like the size of your fist. Yeah, they're big barnacles. <laughs> well, like you're mentioning that, that humpback whale, you know, it was a smaller humpback whale, 30 feet, and that, that peck fin, you know, was bigger than me. So think yeah. of the peck fin on the full-size animal. It's like, dang. Yeah, so. In fact, that, that blue whale, I mean, it was 60, 60 feet, but, I mean, it... Standing next to it, you're like, wow. <laughs> it's, just, it's unbelievable and how high it sits off the ground and seeing the size of the ribs and stuff like that was so, uh, was pretty intense. The humpback's peck fins to like body ratio are the biggest of all the whales. But, yeah. But like the blue whale's peck fin being on the big animal, is it still cl- – how big is the peck fin you think on the blue whale? I think they say less than 10 feet. So they're still smaller so, than the humpback. So, yeah, humpback even still has the biggest. Yeah. 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 Blue whales are so big, though. Yes. Un- it's unfathomable. If that- Did I say that right? I know. I, I We're not good with big words I think today. I lost it, but it had a photo of, of a, a blue whale, fin whale, and a humpback. In one frame? Yeah. What? Remember when the, the um, blue whale pooped on the humpback's face? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds crazy, but the blue no, whale pooped, really and then the humpback the swam humpback through it. Right maybe, through maybe, it. maybe it was too, like too. No, I'm pretty sure. Am you I, definitely have the humpback and the blue whale in the same. I brain. definitely have a fin whale and a humpback, and I have a fin whale and a gray whale passing each other too mm. in Newport. Mm-hmm. But uh, man, I'll we'll have to see if we can find those. That there was, was that just was a picture funny. that someone placed online of. Um, it wasn't even a humpback pack, but there were bones from a, a gray whale pack, and it was. It was huge. I'm trying to see if I can pull it up for you guys, but and in their pectoral flippers, I don't know if we talked about this in another. I think we talked about this in the last episode. It's pretty much like it's your hand, like yeah. your hand bones. Yeah, we're talking about the yeah. Code. There's different lengths of the digits, which is pretty nutty. Yeah, metacarpal bones, pretty much similar to us, but yeah, gray whales having, I mean, uh, humpbacks having that uh, pec that can be one third of their body length is pretty amazing. As I always say, they look like wings. Yes, well, and that's, how, that's what their name, their scientific name means, big-winged New Englander, because the whalers first saw the, these big-winged um, whales in the Atlantic when they started whaling, and they were like, what the heck is this? Which mm. the Atlantic whales have a lot wider peck fins, like more lighter in color on, to- on the top, on the dorsal side. Yeah, I love it. So they it. stand out a lot more from underwater, whereas our whales over here are usually a lot darker. People get mad at me when I say this, but... I- <laughs> the whales, like the Australian hump, like the ones that 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 population, the, the, the Atlantic population, like they're the white on the underside and then on their peck fins is really pretty. It's easier to see from the drone too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to follow them, that's for sure. Our humpbacks are more stealth mode. We had that one calf this past summer. Remember, it was oh, yeah. all like white. Yeah, a lot of white, white on. I think I got photos of that everybody yeah. kept saying oh this is an australian baby yeah. <laughs> so you guys might be noticing that we're talking about how uh you could recognize an australian humpback well it tends to be that uh 
here in the northern hemisphere, we tend to have humpbacks with uh, darker uh, features. And uh, down in the southern hemisphere, for some reason, the humpbacks have uh, some uh, lighter features on the bottom. They tend to have a lot more white on their undersides and their flukes. Yeah. And it's not only uh, sometimes pigment or color differences, even size differences. Uh, on the boat, I always like to tell people that we have the smaller blue whales. Uh, for yep. example, here, uh, you know, on our Monterey boats, we'll sometimes see big blue whales in the mid mid 80s or so. Um, but down in the southern hemisphere, there are official you know, measurements of blue whales being about 98 feet. So, uh, 110 feet, some, some records say, from the old whaling days. Old whaling days, but, you know, they lied about everything. But <laughs> I know, talking to, to John from Cascadia, I remember, yeah, him verif- saying the verified is 98. But, yeah, I've heard that, too, about the uh, unverified records of 110. But mm, there's multiple species out there that actually show a lot of uh, difference in size, even appearance. Uh, depending on what latitude in the, on the Earth you're in. Well, I also feel like in the Southern Hemisphere, a lot of the same, like we'll have similar uh, species like Northern right whales and Southern right whales. The Southern right whales have a lot more white on their bellies. Same thing with the humpbacks. Same thing with Northern right whale dolphins, right dolphins versus yeah. Southern right whale dolphins. Well, minky whales. Minky whales have the, the, the dwarf ones the dwarf, have a lot more yeah. white around the, the pectoral pecs. fin. Yeah, on the body near the fin and on the fin. They have a... We say that ours have like little mittens, yeah. But theirs is like their whole flipper is almost white. Even with our pinnipeds, sometimes, for example, yeah, the, we we're t- we talked a lot about the elephant seals the other day. We have northern elephant seals, and then you get the southern elephant seals, which are immense. They're Way a lot bigger, bigger yeah. than their uh, than our uh, the ones we have here in California. So yeah, depending on what part of the world you're in, the animals look different. I always tell our well watchers that too, you know. You're looking at a different population right now, possibly, from where you're from. So uh, it's not just, you know, you've seen one humpback whale, you, you've seen them all. Yeah, you definitely haven't seen them all if you've seen one, because it's quite a bit of difference when you're in other locations and you see that big white glow under the water mm-hmm. from the pectoral fin. Well, and some of them, especially like with humpbacks, they're such versatile feeders that they use different feeding um techniques based on what they're eating where they are some of it may be a cultural thing too that like hey we all eat this way so you're gonna eat this way too yeah and people always come up to me on the boat and they're like oh well i saw humpbacks in alaska it's just like i saw them bubble feeding so i've Mm -hmm. already seen them do that and then we're like well ours don't bubble feed they lunch feed which can look similar if you're just seeing the feeding behavior the surfacing part. the surfacing part yeah, yeah but um, you're not seeing what's going on underneath the water is what's different. Like in the Atlantic coast, they do a lot of trap feeding and kick feeding, um, and they will do some lunge feeding. And then even watching our humpbacks feed on krill versus feeding on anchovies when it's at the surface, a lot of times when they're feeding on krill, they're rolling on their side and they're really just like side scooping. And then when they're feeding on fish, they're coming straight up out of the water, almost like a spy hop, but with their throat full of fish. Yeah. And these animals being as smart as they are, I mean, I know people, um, in fact, we were talking about trap feeding. I think um, I think last season someone might have witnessed, they're trying to verify if uh, a whale was doing it out here. It certainly mm-hmm. appeared mm-hmm. like it was doing that. So, you know, these whales, you never know. They, they, they might eventually catch on and uh, learn a technique that another population has already known about. And uh, uh, you can always think of these whales as we, the different populations are having different cultures. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, you never know. They'll eventually catch up with the other population and learn that technique. Uh, trap feeding, never know. It might happen here sooner than we think, or it might have already happened. Yeah. Our humpbacks, I like the way Ted Cheeseman explains it. So the humpback whales in California may be one of the more emerging populations post-whaling because they're a very coastal population of whales. They're easy targets for whalers. And so I think we saw this huge bottleneck in um, the population, and they lost a lot of probably culture. Um, and so they're rediscovering habitat. They're in areas they haven't been seen before during human history as their populations recover. They're also starting, to me, over the last five years, I've seen whales just, like, try stuff. I wish we had better, like, ID matches correlated. Like, this whale has been here 
all the time and you've seen it use these different techniques we're not quite there yet with the data but you know we had a couple of whales blowing bubble streams this summer we had whales trying trap feeding yeah the there's summers. a few videos actually of them doing the bubble streaming uh, out here in the bay i have videos and that's what's so cool about having the technology of a drone is that mm -hmm. we're seeing things from above that we would not be able to see from the boat and the water is honestly too green here in monterey to really have divers or like you know yeah, people it's hard researching to get it, and, video. yeah, yeah. So the drone is one of the easiest ways for us to look into the water and see things like that. And this summer, yeah, we did see um, some long bubble streams, mm -hmm. and you see that kind of stuff sometimes on like the breeding grounds. Like the males will do some long bubble streams and stuff. But yeah. this is different because this is on the feeding grounds, and they're doing it around like near schools of fish. Yeah, yeah. And there's so much talk about this humpback population in the North Pacific doing so well that. Uh, Obviously, when you have more animals, they're just going to be kind of spread out throughout the area and intermingling, uh, you know, is going to be uh, more and more possible. Uh, we, we have been talking about the different populations, but isn't there like one record of a Hawaiian whale actually showing mm -hmm. up out here? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so you just never know. One day, this one whale, one whale, yeah, might be coming over going, hey guys, I know this. Yeah, yeah. you could be like, Ted, <laughs> cruise with me, I know a cool route. Yeah, like, come check this out. <laughs> it, it or went, like... You've been talking about this bubble net thing. Let's go to Monterey. <laughs> the, the path was like from Hawaii straight across to, um, what is it, Eureka that's right above us? What's right below Oregon? Yeah, yeah, Eureka? like Eureka Coast. But it, it goes straight into there and yeah. then goes up. There's also a theory about migration route that maybe sometimes the Hawaii Alaskan whales cut inland somewhere off the, the North American continent and then go back out. They make like a V shape. So, and John Kalamakitis always just says like, the Pacific is humpback whale playland. Yeah. So they kind of just go wherever they want. I mean, they're uh, the ones that you see offshore a lot too. And, surprisingly, I've seen them 350 miles offshore. Before. Well, I was gonna say they they pro like think about it halfway between Hawaii and you know anywhere on this this side of the coast. Do you th think that they're finding food like in the middle somewhere too? Yeah, I mean, definitely not as abundant like uh, here. But, yeah, like, but there could be. If there's a school of fish, I bet they'd go for it. Yeah. Why not? I mean, I'd eat it. Take advantage of the snacks while you got them. <laughs> I mean, that was a whale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like snacks on a road trip. In fact, yeah, you know what? You're speak, speaking of the middle of nowhere, um, especially out here with uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. They've been doing a lot of research with the white sharks out here. And uh, I think a lot of you have probably heard that the white sharks uh, sometimes just shoot out to the middle of the Pacific, what's known as the White Shark Cafe, mm -hmm. in between here and Hawaii. And they thought, you know, why out in the middle of nowhere? There's nothing there. But they tagged some of the sharks. Uh, some boats have actually gone out there to see what's going on. And it turns out there's more food um, than they thought. You yeah. Know, there's, there actually is food out there. You know, there's a little, uh, you know, ecosystem out there. There's large fish, uh, even some squid out there for these uh, white sharks to uh, actually go after. So the Pacific being so big, you never know. There's some hot spots out in the middle of nowhere. And it's kind of like the, the, the um, resident killer whales, southern resident killer whales, they leave mm -hmm. at the end of, what, fall, like during wintertime, because the, the salmon head mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They head yeah. offshore. So, yeah. or, but I, I think they, they, say, they do say that fishermen and you know people out there come across them every once in a while. Yeah. When they're not inside the, you know, the fjords and all that stuff. Yeah, oh, when yeah. they're inside but, this, the sound. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's we, there's so much we still don't know. I mean, I think one of the things that we bring up every few weeks is, like, we still have not seen a baleen whale give birth. I mean, all this yeah. technology. Think how vast the ocean is. They then. almost. They oh, almost yeah. got it, like, two weeks ago. I mean, if that's what that was, then whew, yeah. that's pretty close. That's, yeah. like couple minutes off so in hawaii off of maui they were doing a regular i think a regularly scheduled drone flight for the university of hawaii survey project and they just on. happened to fly over a mom and calf and the calf was really small so they stopped and looked at it and the mom still had like blood in the water while she was swimming the calf was really clumsy so they think they missed the birth by less than 30 minutes but still i mean we've never seen the whole process like we don't it's mind-boggling. <laughs> that and offshore killer whales. Yeah, man, we don't know hardly anything about them. And <laughs> and I've I had the um, luckiest experience <laughs> ever. I was on the boat with you. Yeah, of of seeing them, and actually I was able to see them here in Monterey, 
And then like less than a week later, I went down to Newport Beach. It was around Christmas time and I got to see them again. And they were different pods. Mm -hmm. Like we know for sure because yeah. dorsal matches. We were and trying stuff. to do photo ID to yeah. match them. Yeah. But I mean like one time a year they say that they show up on the coast and that's if you see them. <laughs> yeah, I mean there's so many days in the winter where it's been rough weather. What if they came by they're us? Here. Like, they're all out there right yeah, now. Yeah, what if last week when we didn't go anywhere, there's just offshore killer whales playing out there for uh, days? <laughs> yeah, we got lucky in uh, Southern California that, that one year. They showed up by two days in a row. Yeah, that was the same. Yeah, I missed one of the, the second day, I think. Or I missed the first day and got on the second. Yeah, I was working at Dana Point. We uh, uh, chased... Uh, where were we? Yeah, we were just a few miles off of... Uh, Cali and off of Avalon when we caught up to them in the Long Beach boats and uh, you know the um, what else the Newport Coastal was out there too and uh, we got to see them they were going south and then the next day you know we're like oh well you know they're probably gone because when we left them they're going south and the next thing you know next day they popped up right in front of you Newport you guys should see me yeah. when I get a text message <laughs> like I'm like in my car pounding on my steering wheel because I'm like I'm gonna miss it. They're gonna like like these things aren't just sitting in one spot. A lot no. of times they're yeah. traveling and they're going you know ten knots or fifteen knots faster and, than the boat. Yeah, yeah, and and killer whales can either be the best thing to look at or the worst thing to look at. Yeah, and that's just mainly because they can they're either traveling or they're feeding. Yeah, yeah. Perfect example is that sighting I was just telling you guys about. So, uh, you know, I'm watching them off of. Uh, off of Newport, and then I have friends knowing that I'm watching them, and they're like, all right, all right, are they going north or are they going south? I'm like, they're going north. They're like, okay, should I go to Newport? Should I go to Marina Del Rey? Yeah, should you I, drive in should your I, car yeah. to get on the Should next... I go to Long Beach? I'm yeah. like, I'm like go driver. to Long Beach. They went to Long Beach, and they got to catch up to them and see them. <laughs> I, I was on a private boat in Dana Point, and I got a text message. Or no, I, I, got a, I saw a West Coast Whale Geeks Facebook you know, <laughs> post. And they're like, we have the CA fifty ones in Long Beach. I got off that private boat, drove all the way up from Dana Point, all the way to uh, what is it, Harbor Breeze. Mm -hmm. Got on their boat, and then I got the CA fifty ones. That's so funny. You have to just like track in your car to the next nearest harbor to increase your. Chance you know how stressful exactly. those drives are. Very stressful. You're like sweating. I can't believe you didn't. You roll down the window, then it gets cold, then you roll back up. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, these animals will like easily that. travel a hundred plus miles a day. Yeah. So. I'm glad we all kind of in the whale watching world network with each other and make it easy for our friends who want Get their the chance whale, to see these animals. Yeah. The whale text. A good thing to do so that you can kind of have a better opportunity to see something like a blue whale or killer whales is look at uh, the whale watch company's sightings log. Yeah. Because if we're seeing blue whales f five days in a row, it's probably a good chance that if you come on that sixth day that you might see one. So. Yeah. That's one of the best ways to look into stuff like that. Yeah, sure. whenever you do this too, um, especially if you don't live along the coast, and this is kind of you know one of those things that you are doing for a vacation or something like that. Don't pick just one trip. You know, right. uh, do what you can, save up some money, do multiple trips. Uh, every, every time I go to look for wildlife, I, I kid you not, you know, I, I'll save up and I'll try to spend about a week or so in the destination. Also, give yourself some time to actually enjoy the area. Too. Yeah, and sometimes, you know, you get blown off the water, and then if you only plan for one day, then you don't even get to go on the ocean, so definitely try to All right, you guys are jinxing days. my all-day trips. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a whole other thing, is like going out for longer periods of time, too. Yeah, yeah all-day trips are, are definitely um, something that you guys should experience if you can tolerate eight hours plus in the water, and it increases your chances to go find some good stuff, and also gives you time to actually... Spend time with the good stuff if you uh, catch up to it. Obviously, right here in the Monterey area, especially around April. Uh, in fact, I know someone doing an all-day trip in April. Um, <laughs> that's someone, a good time to see uh, orca or killer whales. Someone actually just wrote me uh, last week, and they told me they were coming to Monterey, and they said they had five whale watching trips booked with all different companies. That's cool. That's Honestly, the way to do like, it. I, <laughs> That's the way to do it. That's like, what I did when I went to the East Coast. I booked with like four different companies in yeah. like three different harbors. I mean, because sometimes the companies might be full on the morning trip and you can only get the afternoon and it can go vice versa. So, you know, book as many as you can. Yeah, weather also, depending on where you are at, is a big deal too, especially for us the last few days. Yeah, so that could definitely make or break your trip. So definitely book uh, multiple trips uh, if you can, no matter what type of uh, wildlife you're looking for out there. Yeah, we went out today, and we saw five gray whales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It was pretty chunky, though. But, so. yeah, it was rolly and windy. And Yesterday then, was better. We had 13 gray whales the day before, and it, right before the weather kicked up. And then as soon as the wind started blowing during the trip, that was it. I hopped off that boat today, and I, like, did a wheelie down the boardwalk. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to beat this rain because it was sprinkling at the yeah, wharf, you know? Yeah, I remember. I told you and, to leave. <laughs> and then it just started coming from – when I got up the hill, it started coming from the other direction, and I got soaked. Like, <laughs> I got, it, you can check my Instagram story. I got wet. Bummer. Yeah, in fact, if you guys book trips ahead of time, or, you know, um, sometimes you can kind of get a prediction of what the weather is going to be. But ocean conditions, oh, man, that stuff – uh, changes almost instantly at and times. And it's different than what the land forecast shows. A lot of people, like I said, I'm in the office a lot lately, and people yeah. call and they're like, "Oh, it looks like um, it's going to be sunny." And I'm like, "That doesn't always affect the ocean." Sunny yeah. In, in fact, uh, <laughs> learn to look to read a marine forecast if you haven't already, folks. Uh, learn how to read the swell height and the interval. That's really important. And also, the wind. Basically, what really uh, cancels a whale watch trip usually is high winds and uh, large swells uh, at a close interval. Yeah. So if you need help reading that, I'm sure there's a lot of resources out there, or maybe we can even do a talk on uh, uh, marine conditions one day, teach you guys how to read those uh, NOAA forecasts out there, or windy, and what else we got? Wind alert? Sail flow. Sail flow, you, yeah. You can even call the office. Like, once you, yeah. like not every day, but you can once it gets within, like, four days or three days, the weather, the weather, the weather starts to get pretty... Somewhat predictable. Somewhat predictable, the yeah. Gets pretty good. Yeah, by yeah. the week out. My short and sweet summary is if the wave height is similar to how many seconds apart the waves are, may not be the best thing. If the waves are more than four or five feet high and then they're also only going to be six seconds apart, it's going to be a pretty rocky ride. So just that's kind of a quick way to assess a marine forecast. But definitely call the office. I mean, most of the companies we've ever worked for, the office staff is happy to give you a prediction within you know 72 hours of your trip. That is some good information. Yeah, for sure. Definitely and if you guys think, think you about. might get seasick, definitely don't go on an all-day trip for your first <laughs> go around. Try to book with someone yeah. that does like a two and a half or a three or maybe even just a two-hour whale watch. Try that out <laughs> so you don't uh, lose your breakfast and lunch well, you don't and want dinner to on an eight-hour trip. <laughs> you definitely don't want to completely put yourself off from the idea of whale watching by going on a long trip and being really miserable for that, yeah. that amount of time. It's a really long day. To I had a friend that used to, used to get like that guy Luke that came out with this. Mm-hmm. He got seasick his first time, and then the second time he took seasick medication or um, prevention, and he was fine. So. Yeah, and there's lots of choices at the pharmacy too if you want to talk to a professional about what to do. Yeah, yeah, I'm not prescribing you anything. I mean, we have some we have some tips and tricks, but once you're on the boat, the best remedy for seasickness is getting off the boat. <laughs> yeah, and and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Getting sick over the rail and not yeah. on the boat. Yeah, the crew would love it if you could do that. Okay, we need to say something happier. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about weird stuff. We were going to talk about weird stuff like narwhal tusks. How many minutes are we at? 42 minutes. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about the next episode. We'll be talking about weird stuff. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to end it right here. It's been a great podcast. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, it's always fun. We cover Pachycetus. Dinosaurs. Bones that we don't know a whole lot about, but we're going to use some Google techniques. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, Southern Hemisphere, Northern Hemisphere, humpbacks, humpback culture, feeding, killer whales. Science. Plan- <laughs> planning our whale watch trips. Yes. Dead whales on the beach. If you yeah, made yeah. it this far, thank you for listening. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this podcast. Uh, again, we look forward to hearing your guys' feedback. If you don't follow us on instagram it's at whale nerds and uh thank you for listening thanks everyone thank you